Greetings and welcome to Classic of Difficulties, Difficult Questions in Medicine, Acupuncture, and Beyond. I am your host, Dr. James Mohabali. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine, and I will be your armchair philosopher in residence and your tour guide as we try to ask some difficult questions about medicine. My goal in this podcast is that by asking and unpacking these tough questions, we will maybe leave with a couple of answers, but we'll definitely have a lot of questions by the end. I'm trying to mix it up. I hope you guys appreciate it. This is episode 14, which earthing shoes are right for me. This episode will be a practical episode. At the end of this episode, you will know everything that you could possibly need to know in order to start earthing. What shoes to put on your feet, where you should go to soak up the earth, what situations would be bad situations to earth in, and so on. <clears throat> but, of course, it wouldn't be the classic of difficulties if we didn't get a little philosophical along the way, and a little difficult. So without further ado, let's talk about shoes. Shoes. For those of you who are just tuning in, I will give a brief, very brief introduction to earthing. We have two other episodes we re did recently more or less on this topic, one on electromagnetics in general and health, and the other on some theoretical considerations when it comes to earthing. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think I gave a pretty good explanation on earthing in the Second video, let's jump in our time machine and see if we can find where that was. The concept of earthing is simple. Basically, in a nutshell, the earth has electromagnetic properties that are beneficial to all life. That's why it's such an awesome place to live. And these same properties are beneficial to human life as well. Go figure. Up until very, very recently, man was totally plugged in to these electromagnetic properties. We lived, stood, slept, sat, cooked, ate, and did everything more or less connected to the Earth. But now, with the advent of rubber-soled shoes and a variety of other technological advancements, we are in a position where we are no longer benefiting from these electromagnetic properties. See, rubber, pesky rubber, is an insulator, electrically speaking. This means that it blocks electrical current. And this means that if you put rubber between us and the Earth, we are insulated, we are isolated, we are separated from those beneficial, life-giving electromagnetic properties. So now, since the vast majority of us wear rubber-soled shoes, we are all pretty much no longer plugged in. We are no longer grounded to the Earth. Welcome back to the future. So with that out of the way, Let's talk about footwear. Oh my God, cheers. There are really three options when it comes to earthing, at least in terms of footwear. Basically, you can go barefoot, one. You can wear traditional, usually leather-soled shoes, two. Or you can ground to the earth by using copper or other conductive materials, sometimes in the form of a rivet in the sole of your shoe, that uh, goes through to the other side and contacts your foot, uh, sometimes in the form of a strap that wraps around the ankle and then contacts the earth, uh, sometimes in the form of both, like with earth runners. Conductive materials are also the basis of most non-footwear earthing devices, like earthing blankets, earthing sheets, earthing pads, and so on. Let's talk about going barefoot. There are a lot of benefits to going barefoot. In, in addition to the earthing benefits of going barefoot, where you're in touch with the Earth's electromagnetic properties, there's also the biomechanical benefits of going barefoot, which is a fancy way of saying it changes the way you walk. The basic idea is that your feet are really designed to function without shoes on, and they're certainly not designed to use the shoes we have today. And with these newfangled shoes, the poor foot mechanics and poor gait mechanics, that is how you walk, they, these mechanics will ultimately lead to pain and suffering all up the kinetic chain from your ankles to your knees to your hips to your back to your brain. How does it affect the brain, you might ask? 
Well, when people don't use parts of their body, their brain kind of stops paying attention to them. Like if you just stopped using your hands, eventually you would kind of lose sensation in them. The muscles would wither and they'd start to atrophy and really no longer function as hands. This is what happens in stroke patients and what makes strokes harder to treat the further you get from the event. Notice that right after the stroke, muscle tone is still fine. People still look more or less like they did before the stroke, just a little wilted, usually on one side. But after years and years and years, the muscles just stop looking like functional muscles. They wither. Acupuncture, by the way, is great at treating stroke, especially when you start working together shortly after the stroke. Um, acupuncture for stroke is actually considered to be standard of care in China, that um, as soon as stroke patients are stabilized from the initial event, they start receiving acupuncture and lots of it. And people are able to make some pretty tremendous recoveries with this intense and uh, promptly delivered level of intervention. Anyway, so the, the same withering um, in stroke patients is really kind of what happens to your feet when you trap them in shoes. Instead of functioning like feet, they start to kind of take on a different shape. They become kind of weird, inert, shoe-shaped hooves, really. It's like you might as well be standing on top of peg legs. Your feet aren't doing anything, so your brain just shuts off a huge portion of itself. I don't know if you've ever seen that homunculus where, you know, the uh, the feet and the hands are just this huge, huge amount of nerve endings. <clears throat> So the longer you're in shoes, the bigger of a problem it becomes. You might not notice the change after 20 years of shoes, maybe, but after 80 years, you would expect a lot of functional and structural changes to the brain. So people have concluded that this plays a major role in decline with aging, Alzheimer's, dementia, and all that stuff. Part of aging gracefully is deliberately doing things to keep our mind and our body sharp and our feet and our hands, like I was just saying, have some of the highest concentrations of nerve endings in the body. A huge portion of your brain, both motor and sensory, is dedicated and allocated to paying attention to your feet and your hands. So in order to keep your brain sharp, keep your feet and your hands sharp. Use them every day. And one way to use them every day is by walking barefoot or by using some of these barefoot shoes. Fortunately, pretty much all earthing shoes, which is what we're going to be talking about today, tend to fall into the barefoot shoe movement, which is also referred to as zero rise or zero drop footwear. The goal of this footwear is that it tries to restore a more natural shape to the foot, uh, with particular emphasis on the heel, um, and it gives the foot a more active role. Part of how this is accomplished is by having a very thin sole so that your feet are sensitive and they can kind of tell what's going on underneath. And also by not having the standard heel rise that you see on all modern shoes where the heel is thicker than the forefoot, um, you know, your standard sneaker rise. Um, another part of these barefoot shoes is by having a much larger width in the forefoot so that your toes can spread out and that each one, instead of just kind of sitting there doing nothing, uh, it can help in grabbing the ground and stabilizing your foot. And as I said, there are a lot of benefits to this type of footwear. They can be very helpful for treating and preventing back pain, knee pain, hip pain, ankle pain, all sorts of issues that are caused by poor body mechanics. And again, it goes all the way up the chain. Your, your neck pain could be related to your feet. Many schools of thought, both Eastern and Western, say that if you don't correct problems at the foot, if you don't correct problems at the root, then you won't be able to correct problems anywhere else on the tree. So your neck pain, your headaches, any kind of structurally based stagnation could in fact just be caused by the fact that your shoes are forcing your body into an unnatural position. So that covers the benefits of any type of barefoot or zero drop approach to footwear, which of course includes being literally barefoot. But returning to the context of earthing in particular, we are now going to discuss the pros and cons of being barefoot for earthing. There are many arguments that people give as to why being barefoot is the best way to go with earthing. The first argument people give for going barefoot is that it's traditional. People have gone barefoot for centuries, millennia even. And while that may be true, it's 
only true in certain climates in certain places, and even in some warmer climates, people generally preferred to have shoes. Ancient Rome, ancient Israel, ancient China, many parts of Native America, people liked having shoes. That said, they were nothing like the shoes we have today. Their shoes were contraptions made out of rope and leather and wood, and they definitely did not have any kind of synthetic petroleum-based rubber. In fact, in many civilizations, there were actually these laws about being barefoot. And I'm not talking about laws that prohibit regular people from going barefoot, like no shirt, no shoes, no service. I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about laws that mandate that serfs and slaves, you know, the lowest class of people, have to be barefoot. That they're mandated to be barefoot at all times. That going barefoot in these societies is really a punishment and a way of recognizing and reinforcing the low social status. Like, you could be dressed to the nines, but as long as you were a slave, you had to be barefoot. And to everyone around you, it was thus immediately recognizable that you were barefoot and that you were a slave. We might just think it's no big deal, but feet are really extremely important, both symbolically and culturally. For the ancient Greeks, the essence of hospitality was giving your guests a good foot bath when they arrived. In the New Testament, there's tons and tons of symbolism regarding feet, from discussions of loosening sandal straps to Christ himself washing his disciples' feet as a gesture of humility and lowliness, and then commanding his disciples to do the same. Think about it. If Before people rode horses or had chariots and carts, the average person was completely reliant on their feet. If you wanted to get anywhere, if you wanted to see anything, if you wanted to experience anything at all in the world, you were totally reliant on your feet to be able to get you to where you wanted to go. From the time you started walking as a toddler to the time at the end of your life, the only way that you could experience what the world had to offer was your own two feet. In the Chinese understanding of anatomy, our feet have a lot to do with our ability to pursue and accomplish our destiny. They get us to where we need to be. So any discussion of feet isn't just a discussion of biomechanics or back pain. We're also tapping into this ongoing dialogue with our ancestors and with the rich symbol that is our feet. And we'll see a little bit more about that when we look at the Chinese description of the energetic anatomy of the foot later. But so long story short, it's really not all that traditional to be barefoot. And even if it was, if people are only healthy when they're barefoot, then we would expect to see chronic inflammatory disease among any shoe-wearing people from ancient China to ancient Rome onwards. And if electron transfer is the mechanism by which earthing works, then we would expect to see a rise in chronic inflammatory disease in areas that are dry but still wear shoes, or in areas where the footwear is a little thicker than usual, um, like the wood block uh, shoes that are part of J Japanese and Chinese culture. And we really don't see that. We don't really don't see a spike in chronic disease like we're seeing nowadays that happened um, in correlation to the invention and refinement of shoes in China. So what's the deal? Well, naturally, all of this points to a new theory, the need for a new theory of a mechanism of earthing. Um, we already discussed some of the shortcomings of the electron transfer theory in the last video on earthing, which is linked above and below, but we outlined the important roles that a new theory would serve, but we really didn't get into what would be a good replacement theory. So the question is, where can we find such a replacement theory. Well, today is your lucky day because Chinese medicine happens to have such a theory, and the theory comes primarily from Qigong practice. Qigong is a catch-all term for any kind of therapeutic exercise that is done for physical, mental, or spiritual advancement. In fact, it's actually quite a modern term. Uh, an older term would be Dao Yin. Um, Qigong includes everything from things that look like Tai Chi to these intense sinew tensioning exercises um, to unusual things like 
generating as much saliva as possible by moving your tongue around your mouth for a few minutes and then swallowing all that saliva that you've accumulated, which is awesome, by the way. It's pretty cool. It's weird, but it's awesome. So Qigong, as you can see, is a very broad field. But the practice of Qigong has some general rules to it that people have figured out over the millennium. One rule, for example, is that in general, it's best to do Qigong outside. There are, of course, indoor Qigongs, but most Qigong is best done outside. The reason why is that nature has all kinds of awesome power, and you really want to tap into that power. You want to engage with how great nature is. You want to take it in and heal yourself using nature. Even a lot of people that don't do Qigong are all about this, from Henry David Thoreau in Walden to the modern Japanese practice of forest bathing. People are just aware that being in nature has tremendous healing potential. But in Chinese medicine and Qigong, we know that not only is there a general non-specific healing power of nature, but that there are specific aspects of nature that accomplish specific things and specific therapeutic goals in the body. So as I was saying in the episode on EMF, electromagnetic fields, the heavens are yang and the earth is yin. So if we want to strengthen our yin, if we want to strengthen our physical form, if we want to strengthen our grounding, we should do qigong that involves the earth. If we want to strengthen our yang, if we want to strengthen our spirit, we want, should do qigong that involves the heavens and the sun. It can get really, really specific, like holding certain postures in front of specific species of trees and that sort of thing. So in qigong, what we're doing is we're taking in nature into our body in order to accomplish specific goals. Another general rule of qigong is that you don't want to do qigong in a thunderstorm unless you're specifically trying to harness the power of that storm, that is. But that's a rather advanced technique and not something your average person gets up to. It's certainly not something I've ever done. But if you're doing just doing your regular exercises, the energy of the storm is far too chaotic, and there's a good chance that a big thunderstorm will throw your own chi off. Makes sense, right? Thunderstorms are a really big deal, and it's hard to pay attention to anything else when you are smack dab in the middle of one. And there's a lot of chaotic electrical activity happening since we are partially electrical beings. These thunderstorms and this electrical activity definitely have an effect on us. But the most important rule that I want to talk about here is this rule about the feet. We know that we want to be in nature, but there's a rule that says you shouldn't do Qigong while barefoot. But... You also shouldn't do Qigong while wearing rubber-soled shoes. If you've been following our discussion, it should be obvious why we don't want to wear rubber shoes. We want to harness the energy from the earth. We want to harness yin qi from the earth in order to nourish our own yin qi. And rubber blocks that. That's the whole principle of earthing. So the recommendation in Qigong as to what we should be wearing in our feet is flat, flexible, thin-soled shoes made of natural material. So why would we not want to be barefoot? Well, we want to take in nature, but we don't want to do so indiscriminately. To clarify what I mean, we'll look at concrete first. It used to be that in the old days, if you put a car battery directly onto concrete, then over time you would completely drain that car battery. Nowadays, they've made some innovations in battery cases using particular materials, but if you put uh, the electrical cell directly on the floor, or you put it on the floor in a natural material case, um, like wood or natural rubber, like they used to have, then the battery would drain. Now, imagine you're doing qigong, you're trying to strengthen your body, but you're doing it barefoot on concrete. Instead of strengthening yourself, you're actually draining yourself, and your qi is just going into the concrete, and you can feel it. Think about how you feel after you've been walking around on concrete floors all day. There's a reason why cashiers and factory workers have those little squishy mats. It's because if they stood on concrete all day without them, they'd all be in constant pain. So in this case, we actually do want electrically insulating footwear, just like we want an electrically insulating battery case. We don't want our energy to leak into the concrete. Science says that the reason this happens is because concrete absorbs moisture, and that moisture interacts with carbon atoms to draw electricity out of the battery. So dampness, moisture, plays a big part here. 
Chinese medicine observes that this type of issue with energy drainage can occur in certain natural environments. Some environments, like damp environments, are especially prone to this issue. Cold environments have a similar problem. Think about it. Do you really want to stand or sit on damp, cold ground? But the thing is that the Chinese understanding of a location isn't just limited to the temperature and moisture level. The Chinese understanding of place and geography is so complicated that it has a complete science unto itself, and that science is called feng shui. There are so many different things that can go wrong or go right in a geographical location, and it's really hard to keep track of and figure out all of them. Sometimes it's physical, like the arrangement of mountains around a spot, but other times it's spiritual, like Indian burial ground type stuff. You never know who's buried where, or what went on in their lives, or how they died. So your best bet would be to just wear thin shoes, and to put a barrier, a small barrier, between you and all that evil chi that's out there. And my sense is that people everywhere have traditionally understood this. It's not just China. We, as moderns, tend to have a bit of a naive perspective about nature. Since we've lost contact with it, we are deeply, deeply aware of how much we need to reconnect, how much nature is like our long-lost lover that if only we could meet her again, then everything would be perfect. And that's true. Nature is beautiful, and nature is healing. But nature is also brutal and murderous and harsh. Anyone who's ever tried living in the desert or walking barefoot in the desert can tell you that. It's not a walk in the park. Even the beach, one of our favorite environments, is often brutally harsh and exposed if you need to live there for any amount of time. There are good and there are bad aspects to nature, and there are good and there are bad energies in nature. All of them certainly deserve respect and admiration, but some of them are best respected from a distance, like grizzly bears or poison ivy. Similarly, part of mankind's job, part of who we are, is this separation from nature. We are not like the naked, barefoot animals exposed to the elements. We can build shelters, we can fashion shoes, we can separate ourselves from nature and earth in order to reach a higher purpose, which is heaven. We have upright posture, we're heading from earth to heaven. So our footwear, our technology, is really part of what makes us humans. It's an expression of our divine purpose that we try to separate ourselves from the earth. In the modern age, when we have found ourselves completely divorced from any kind of contact with nature, we can easily make the mistake that we're supposed to return to some kind of primal, animal self. But mankind really thrives in the mediation between the Apollonian and the Dionysian, between the refined and the primal. The question is, where along the spectrum between these two things do we fall? One possible Chinese medical answer is that we fall two-thirds up, two-thirds away from Earth, and one-third away from Heaven. So we are really more Heaven than we are Earth. Right, so barefoot is out the window. Obviously barefoot makes sense in some places, like inside your house and at the beach, but it's clear from what we just discussed that we shouldn't be indiscriminately walking around barefoot everywhere especially in the modern age, when we're not just walking barefoot on natural material, we're walking barefoot on concrete, on asphalt, on all sorts of strange modern materials that each have their own impact on the human body. And as you might imagine, most of them are fairly harsh and intense and grating, like concrete. So, if not barefoot, then what? Well, my personal favorite is double-soled leather moccasins. They are like the perfect footwear. They'll mold to your feet, they can get wet and then they dry, and you can feel every bit of the ground underneath you. When you wear them on your feet, you really feel like you're walking in the footsteps of generations and generations of ancestors before you. And once the outer sole wears out, you can replace it with another. Even Lewis and Clark, American white men as they were, had their whole crew outfitted with moccasins for their journey. It was by far and away the best footwear choice for their lifestyle and for their relationship with nature. Having left society behind, they needed something more natural. And even walking around my neighborhood on well-groomed lawns, my neighbor's lawns are well-groomed, not mine, I feel connected. I feel mindful. My gait changes. The way my foot strikes the ground changes. 
And just wearing the moccasins starts to change me a little. My favorite supplier of earthing moccasins, by the way, is Moccasins Canada. They are linked down in the descriptions below. My favorite is the double-soled oil tan moose hide moccasins. But they are my favorite. What is the problem with them? Well, firstly, maintenance. Maintenance used to just be part of life in the modern world. If you had leather, you were constantly oiling your leather. If you had a cast iron pan, you were constantly seasoning your cast iron pan. If you had anything at all of value, there were always these constant maintenance processes in order to keep them in good shape and to slow down the inevitable wear and tear, the death and decline that will eventually take all material things. This maintenance thing is a totally different mindset and a totally different lifestyle than the one that we are accustomed to. Nowadays, we buy shoes, and then when we wear out the sole, instead of resoling it, we throw out the whole shoe and buy new ones. I believe that there is merit in returning to a more mindful relationship to our possessions, and I believe that ongoing maintenance is part of that. Maintenance completely transforms the relationship that you have to your possessions. Why? Because you get to witness the process of death and decay. You get to see natural processes try to reclaim your object. You stare into the abyss. Just like that cast iron pan rusts, so will all matter and all order descend into chaos. But then you come in. By your effort, by your hands, by your spirit, the pan is redeemed from corruption. What was dying is now restored to life and restored to a higher function. Every time you season your cast iron pan, every time you oil your leather shoes, it's an icon of the resurrection. It's an icon of the immortality of the soul and the little piece of transcendence that we've all been given. On a very practical note, another issue with uh, leather moccasins is that if you have any plans on walking on asphalt, concrete, on any of these modern materials that are everywhere, then you are going to shred through your leather moccasins very quickly. Not only have I spent a lot of time wearing moccasins, I have also shredded through them. And I shredded through them so quickly that I started looking for rubber-soled alternatives. Gasp. Rubber. Yes, but my rubber-soled alternatives are still earthing shoes. The rubber-soled earthing shoes usually involve copper and conductive metals, which we will be discussing momentarily. But this shredding of leather isn't just a practical issue. It's really emblematic of the particular position that we are in as people. We are everywhere surrounded and engulfed by modernity. It's almost impossible to travel any distance in the United States through remotely hospitable land without encountering a paved road. If we really want to live a lifestyle where leather-soled shoes make sense... We're going to have to abandon everything that we're accustomed to, and we're going to have to return to a long-forgotten way of life. I personally would love it if my life looked a little more like the traditional life of the Native American tribes that make my moccasins. And I hope that whenever I oil the leather sole, I learn to participate in the type of solitude and mindfulness that was abundant and commonplace in ages past. But not even most Native Americans are living traditionally nowadays. Inuits might still hunt seals, for example, and process them in the traditional way, but usually they have snowmobiles. It's a big question as to whether it's even possible to return to a traditional lifestyle, given how far we've come from it, how much we've changed both ourselves and the world around us. So that's where copper wire comes in. And that's where my rubber-soled shoes, augmented with conductive material, also come into play. This is where my second favorite, a close runner-up, and my daily driver comes into play. My earth runners, which are also linked down below. The earth runner is a rubber-soled sandal with a thin, flat sole. Again, zero-drop, barefoot-style footwear. In this sandal, there is a copper rivet that extends through to the other side and contacts the earth. Attached to this copper rivet is a strap that has within it stainless steel threads that conduct all that good earth chi into your foot and ankle. The rivet is located between the first and second toes, attached to a thong strap, which is more or less stimulating the acupuncture point liver to. 
when I'm earthing in modern life, which is anytime I'm not at the office, uh, because my office has concrete floors with a thin layer of commercial carpeting over it, I'm most often wearing my earth runners. So I definitely love them and I think they're great, but they introduce a whole layer of complexity, a whole layer of conscious decision making and planning and inventing that is completely absent from traditional footwear. We're basically trying to reinvent the wheel. I'll clarify. When you put natural material in between your foot and the earth, you're utilizing the natural anatomy and thus the natural energetics of the human body. The foot itself is designed in a specific way, and according to Chinese medical thinking, different parts of the foot do different things. I mean, there's six different acupuncture channels and over 25 points on your foot alone, that's not including the ankle, and each point and each channel has a different function, not just biomechanically, but also for your literal organs. We're talking about the liver channel, the spleen channel, the kidney channel, the stomach channel. They affect your organs. So we will get into some of the specifics of this momentarily. But so when we use natural footwear, we work with the system as it is. When we put on our moccasins, we kind of take the foot and we work with it. We work with it as it has been given to us. But we pay for this simplicity by the constant maintenance and resoling and wear and tear issues associated with natural materials. Nothing natural lasts forever. But as soon as we say, I want a durable rubber sole, then a whole cascade of decisions falls upon our shoulders. As soon as we interfere with a single step in the process, we disturb the whole equilibrium of nature, and we become the little old lady who swallowed the fly. The moment we fall away from nature, we throw ourselves into this unbelievable degree of complexity, and even if we find a good answer to the problems that arise, there will always, always, always be unintended consequences. So we are stuck with many, many questions, like, where do I put the strap? How do I earth the foot? What materials do I use to earth the foot? Where should the foot be earthed? How do I encourage a barefoot walking stride? And so on, and so on, and so on. It is extremely hard to understand the consequences of our decisions without a physiological understanding of the design and purpose of the foot and the energetics involved. <clears throat> First, looking at the grounding material, the common choice is copper because it is conductive. But the question is, given what we were talking about with not being barefoot, given what we were talking about with concrete, the question is whether do we whether we even want conductive material between us and the earth. The benefit of leather, wood, rope, etc., all of which are the normal material of traditional shoes, is that all of these materials are mildly insulating. One could certainly make an argument that we actually want to be insulated from the natural world, but only enough to protect us. The second issue that arises with metallic grounding materials is based on a Chinese five element perspective. The five elements are, in order, wood, fire, earth, metal, water. So, our plan is to connect with the earth, which you might guess has to do with the earth element. Uh, of course, there's a different word for earth. Um, so, earth is, uh, there's TND, heaven and earth, but then there's also two, which is the five element earth. But, let's just say it's the earth element. But, in reality, what we're doing is connecting to the metal element. And metal, in Chinese thought, encompasses all rocks, all minerals, whereas earth is the soil. So the analogy would be whether we want to walk barefoot on the soil or whether we want to walk barefoot on rocks. Rocks are hard and unforgiving, and few people would choose walking on hard rocks over soft soil. And in addition, rocks actually have similar energetics to concrete. Just like sitting on concrete for long periods of time will eventually make your butt cold and make your back hurt, the same applies to rocks. We don't really want to sleep, sit, or walk on rocks for any prolonged amount of time. But in our modern grounding model, we need rocks. We need conductive metal to get through the rubber sole. Another issue has to do with the discussion from the last episode on Earthing uh, about electrons. And that is linked above and below. In that episode, we highlighted the shortcomings of the electron theory of earthing. However, when we use copper as an earthing material, 
the decision to use copper kind of assumes that the beneficial properties from the earth are in fact electrons or at the at the very least are conducted through copper in fact whenever we make a modern innovation whenever we invent something the implication is that we understand the mechanism behind something how something works it's only if we have a potential mechanism that we can begin to suggest a new thing to meet the requirements of that mechanism. When, in fact, the reality is, as I pointed out in the last episode, that we really don't understand all of the myriad ways that earthing benefits us. In contrast, when we based our therapy on tradition and traditional practices and traditional understandings, the fundamental assumption is that we as individuals do not understand everything completely. This is why we have to rely on our ancestors, who are cumulatively, at the very least, probably way smarter than us. And our ancestors were doing this too, so we're building this you know, continuous chain so that the chain just gets stronger and stronger and we get smarter and smarter the longer that we rely on our ancestors' knowledge. So if we rely on our ancestors' traditional knowledge, we inherit these generations of experience, these generations of people that are all trying to figure out life and to piece it all together. We can borrow from their experience. We can make ourselves that much stronger. But when we try to do something modern, something new, when we interfere with nature and make a new invention, we really don't know exactly what we're missing out on and what we've accidentally shut out. So what if the beneficial properties of earthing don't actually have anything to do with electrons? What if it doesn't even have to do with electromagnetics? Then copper would be a poor material choice. Experientially, and experience I suppose is the end all be all, I would say that the earth runners do in fact work. And that's what really matters, experience. After taking a walk in my Earth Runners, I definitely feel very similarly to when I take a walk in my moccasins. I think that whatever the mechanism of earthing might be, that it's conducted perfectly fine through the rivet and strap apparatus of my Earth Runners. However, there are some obvious noticeable differences. These differences can be easily understood by looking at the Chinese medical anatomy of the foot. There are over 25 points on the foot, but the two that we really need to know are Kidney 1, Yong Chuan, Bubbling Spring, and Stomach 42, Chong Yang. Chong's rushing is one rendering of that. Kidney 1 is the only main channel point that is on the sole of the foot. And given what I was saying earlier about the profound importance of the feet and walking, it's easy to see that kidney one is probably one of the most important points on the body. And kidney one is an incredible point. And, and it's used to treat a variety of things from hypertension to foot pain, obvious, to sleep issues, to negotiating spiritual concerns with dying patients in hospice. It's also very common to use external herbal treatment on kidney one, again, for hypertension, that's a very popular one or even just to draw toxins out of the body, or to get better sleep. There are these awesome convenient foot patches that I've been playing around with recently that are designed for people to use while sleeping, and my wife swears by them, and they are linked in the description below. Kidney one is nestled just underneath the ball of your foot, in the squishy V area that's two-thirds away from your heel, and one-third away from the base of your toes. Not the tip of your toes, but the base of your toes. A link to an image will be in the description below. Focusing on kidney one and using it to draw energy up from the earth is totally foundational to Qigong practice. <clears throat> the absolute most basic Qigong posture ever, the Wuji posture, out of which all other postures and movements emerge, which is why it's called the Wuji posture, begins first with standing feet, shoulder width apart, and putting your weight squarely into kidney one, not on your heel, not on the ball of your foot, but on kidney one. Lots of beginner Qigong students do not understand the experience of drawing Qi up through kidney one and rooting down into the earth. Fortunately, there's a quick trick that you can use to pump the energy, to pump the energy of the bubbling spring, kidney one, in order to draw your attention to the point 
and to activate it to help pump the Earth's yin energy and store it in your body. It'll also give you a palpable experience so that you know what you're looking for the next time that you try to do this process so that you can gradually learn how to do it without the pumping. The trick is to crunch up your toes like you're trying to make a fist with your foot. You'll immediately notice that this creates tension at kidney one, activating the point, and that when you do it, this actually starts to loosen up the back of your legs, your buttocks, and all the way up to your low back, which is the pathway of the kidney channel and the kidney sinew channel. Why does this matter? Because when you walk, especially when you walk with proper form, as you do when you're using barefoot style shoes, you naturally clench your toes and pump kidney one as part of that process. In the very act of walking, you're actually naturally pumping energy up from the earth into your body. So with leather moccasins, for example, you're automatically doing this pumping process, no problem. But looking at a pair of earth runners, you'll notice that the rivet, the copper rivet, is up between the toes at liver two. And that strap, or that the strap that um, is attached to the rivet wraps around and goes down and around the foot and the ankle and kind of snakes around the whole foot. But at kidney one, there's nothing. There's just rubber below your foot. So when that pumping occurs naturally, when you're walking, when that pumping of kidney one occurs, you're ending up just pumping a dry well. There's nothing to pump. You're on rubber. So experientially, the earth runners are effective at earthing for sure. But from my perspective and based on this theory, we can see that they're not going to be as effective at nourishing the kidneys or nourishing the primordial yin of the body. They might not be effective for certain types of back pain, for example. They'll restore you and they'll correct your electromagnetic field, but if you want to regulate your hormones, strengthen the bones, undo aging, promote long life, all of these kidney type things, you're going to need to do some other form of earthing as well. The earth runners people knew about kidney one. It's something they actually talk about on their website. And they knew how important it was, but unfortunately, practicality gets in the way. And again, once we start this process of invention and innovation, it's just kind of one thing after the, the other. We, you know, we keep, uh, keep on this hamster wheel of invention. So the old design of the Earth Runners originally had you stepping on the metal, right? They had metal at kidney one in addition to several other places, the heel and underneath the ball of the foot. And this actually creates a better, more physiologically correct type of grounding. However... Displacement obviously had some problems, which is why they changed it. Like the fact that it resulted in you stepping directly onto metal all day, every day. So I didn't have these type of shoes, but I'm guessing it probably hurt after a while. A lot of people do complain about stepping on the metal hurting in certain barefoot applications or earthing applications. So I am thinking about doing an experiment to my beloved earth runners to put a copper rivet through the kidney one area. Um, and if I do, um, I will let you know to, uh, how it turned out in the comments below. So like I was saying before, once we start to innovate, the only solution is to keep innovating. The other acupuncture point that I mentioned is stomach 42, Chong Yang. Stomach 42 is an inconspicuous point on the top of the foot facing the sky, unlike kidney one, which faces the earth. It's wedged between four little bones in a tiny crevice, but it has this massive artery, the dorsalis pedis, running through this tiny crevice, and you can even take the pulse there. In fact, they did in Neijing times, uh, which is the oldest, uh, one of the oldest texts in Chinese medicine, one of our classical texts. They took the artery, they took the pulse at multiple locations, and stomach 42 was a very important point for evaluating the lower body. But in order to understand the relevance of stomach 42, we have to look at the rest of the foot, and we have to learn a little bit about Chinese religious practices. The traditional Chinese sacrificial vessel is a three-legged cauldron. And when I say traditional, I mean like 2000 BC, like for as long China has been around, as long as China has been around, their sacrificial vessel has been a bowl on three legs. There's another type of sacrificial vessel, but this is the main one. 
So you know that they probably had some reason for doing so, for designing it in this way. Well, aside from the fact that the number three is deeply revered in Chinese thought, they love trinities, they also have this rule that I've mentioned before, namely that the microcosm mirrors the macrocosm, the big mirrors the little. Everything that is true about the human body is also true about the universe, and vice versa. And the human foot has three major points of contact with the earth. The heel, the outside ball of the foot, and the inside ball of your foot. So the foot itself is a type of sacrificial tripod, and stomach 42, the rushing chong, the rushing pulsation, this vibrant pulsation, is the top of this sacrificial dish, where the four little bones cradle this pulse, this pulse that is the symbol of the fact that you are alive. And remember what I was saying before about destiny and the foot. The foot is what allows you to complete your destiny. It's what allows you to get there. So the act of walking and attempting to fulfill our destiny is the beginning of this sacrifice, the sacrifice that we call life. We hope that when we are on our deathbed, that what we did with our feet has made our lives, our stories, our everything into a worthy offering, a worthy sacrifice, a worthy homage to the powers that brought us into this world and gave us life throughout the years that we were lucky enough to have it. We hope that everything that we did, everything we learned, all that struggle and strife, the number three is deeply revered in Chinese thought, they love trinities, they also have this rule that I've mentioned before. The microcosm mirrors the macrocosm, the small mirrors the big. Everything that is true about the human body is true about the universe and vice versa. And the human foot has three major points of contact with the earth. The heel, the outside ball of your foot, and the inside ball of your foot. The foot itself is a sacrificial tripod. And stomach 42, this vibrant pulsation, is the top of this sacrificial dish, where the four little bones cradle this pulse, this pulse that is the symbol of the fact that you are alive, the vibrant arterial blood going outwards to experience the world. And remember what I was saying before about destiny and the foot. The foot is what allows you to complete your destiny. It's what allows you to get there. So the act of walking and attempting to fulfill our destiny is the beginning of this sacrifice, this sacrifice that we call life. We hope that when we are on our deathbed, that what we did with our feet has made our lives, our stories, into a worthy offering, a worthy sacrifice, a worthy homage to the powers that brought us into this world and gave us life throughout the years that we were lucky enough to have it. We hope that everything we did, everything we learned, all the struggle and strife, can go up to heaven and be pleasing to God. And this is the hidden meaning in your foot. That's right, your foot the ones that you've been carrying around, the ones that you shove into rubber-soled shoes and think nothing of most of the day until, at the end of the day, you take them out and you rub them briefly, and then you put them into your rubber-soled slippers. So you can see that there's actually quite a lot at stake in the question of what you should put on your feet. After all, your feet are the thing that allow you to accomplish your destiny. They're the thing that allow you to make your life into a worthy sacrifice, into something that has greater, deeper, transcendent meaning. When we make the decision between earth runners and leather moccasins, we also make a statement about our relationship to nature, whether we want to return to simplicity, or whether we feel that modern life has come too far, and we've come too far, and the only way to return, the only way to reach into the past is by continuing forward. But perhaps the most valuable aspect of picking between these two barefoot-style earthing options is that both of them require a conscious change. Both ask you to do something different than normal modern life. Earthing, barefoot, leather, earth runners, whatever you do, earthing is an invitation to spend 
at least 30 minutes of your day walking on natural material. Not stepping on our nice stained and sealed wood floors, not stepping on durable concrete sidewalks or asphalt roads, but seeking out and finding somewhere in your world that's still natural and by spending as much time as possible there. It means sometimes consciously abandoning your normal life and abandoning your modern life for at least a moment and choosing something that is different. And whether that thing is traditional or something postmodern, it's going to be something more hospitable and more human-centric, and hopefully it creates a healthier version of the future. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classic of Difficulties. We hope that you enjoyed our explorations today, and we hope that you'll tune in next time for more difficult questions. If you have any topics you want us to cover, or any awesome health professional you know that you'd like to see us interview, we would love to meet them. So reach out and let us know. Please share this episode with your friends, your family, your co-workers, your enemies, and everyone in between. Your interaction and support helps us keep making the content that we love to make and that you love to listen to.